the pursuit of a world that is free from weapons of mass destruction is something that's very close to my own heart personally. It was one of the fundamental reasons I joined the Scottish National Party and is therefore one of the reasons that I'm standing here before you today. However, as Malcolm Chisholm's presence and those of other colleagues from other parties demonstrates, this is an issue which transcends party political politics in Scotland. I believe that we have a collective responsibility to support a new and stable security solutions for the Middle East and beyond. The challenge, yes, is daunting. It will require not only cooperation across the Middle East, but also the resolute support of the international community. It's the fact that the peoples of the Middle East, Arab, Iranian, Israeli, Turkish, uh, have been held back from what they could contribute to global progress, global stability and global prosperity by the politics of the region. This subject is connected with those subjects. And you're going to hear from some very expert, very experienced people during the course of today about how we can link these wider issues with, in time, in my view, the absolute necessity to take nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction out of this region under properly constructed international arrangements and international rules. I think this conference is a very timely conference because as uh, Sir Jeremy mentioned, a sea change is happening in the Middle East and uh, if we do not deal with the developments in the Middle East in a timely fashion, it can become very dangerous for the whole world. As the international system evolves to a new world order, Emerging challenges and opportunities require all members of the international community to be more vigilant and adaptive in their policies. I think grasping the right understanding of the nature of the ongoing changes is imperative in order to adapt the right approaches. Russia stressed that um, the nuclear weapon free zones established in line with accepted international guidelines can play a critical role in strengthening the nuclear non proliferation regime and contributing to international peace and security. Russia strongly believes that a constructive approach that considers and secures interests of each state is the only path to reaching out common goals of creating a safer and more stable Middle East. So in this case, we urge all the states of the region to contribute to preparation and holding of the conference. Its success, first of all, depends on the political will of the Middle East countries to cooperation and constructive decision making. Finland, as the host government, is ready to arrange the conference in Helsinki in principle any time during 2012. But the month of December has been frequently mentioned in the consultations as a possibility and logistical planning is underway accordingly. I would like to remind of the benefit of remaining realistic and managing the expectations for the conference. It is certainly important to take advantage of the opportunity this platform can provide also in the light of the recent regional developments. The facilitator maintains a clear goal and commitment to work towards the organization of the conference in 2012 and will continue doing his utmost in this regard, as it is our shared aim to ensure that the conference marks a successful starting point for a process leading towards the common goal, the establishment of a zone the facilitator is grateful for intensified efforts by all relevant parties in support of this. To all here today, your work is admirable. A Middle East free from the arms of mass destruction is a noble objective and an attainable one. The goodwill of the peoples of the Middle East, the efforts of the United Nations associations all over the world, the wise calculations of the world's statespeople will make attainable that noble objective. But alas, we miss one component of the aforementioned trio, 
the wisdom of the world's leaders. Comprehensive application of the relevant UN resolutions on the Middle East will eliminate the need for weapons of mass destruction. Security of all will be ensured by peace, not by war. In my profession in medicine, we're urged to do no harm. The aspiration of the UN and Association and all your panel, all the panel members, I'm sure, is to do no harm. But whenever the gap between Israel with conventional weapons and its neighbors is diminished, they use a cynical term which many people in this room will be familiar with. It's called mowing the lawn. Whenever the grass starts to grow up, it is mowed and kicked back down again. So please, panel, tell me how you can engender a sense of security with conventional weapons, and then this afternoon we can have a great party and talk about a fantasy. Uh, in Russia, we don't expect any uh, dream dreams to come true in this conference, and we really understand that there, there could be no any uh, strong breakthroughs made overnight. We insist that this conference has to be held in December this year, even uh, only because we need to start the process of exchanging views. We need to gather all the uh, states of the region together at one table, and then and there we could discuss. We could help them to start discussion of all the terms of all the problems that you mentioned in your question. I uh, very much share the emotion expressed by the uh, physician who asked the question and uh, the Turkish people's sympathy is with the Middle Eastern peoples and particularly with the Palestinian people and I can see how dire the situation in Gaza is. That is the expectation of the Arab countries and the countries of the region that they see Turkey uh, as a very familiar country, as a as an immediate neighbor, and they also see the merit uh, in Turkey's relations with the European countries, particularly its presence in other European and Euro-Atlantic institutions. And I think this is an extremely valuable asset. We're now moving into a specific session for a couple of hours uh, on a Middle East free of weapons of mass destruction, uh, and. I want us to remember, please, Mark Fitzpatrick's um, enjoining us to be forward-looking. Um, I wanted to start with a quote from Ariel Sharon made right after the Aqaba summit in 2003, when he said, ultimately, permanent security requires peace, and permanent peace can only be obtained through security. Now, I, I think that's a fair statement, but I also think that in a sort of ironic sense, we need to reflect on the idea that, that permanent security is probably an illusion. And that permanent peace, I think, is possibly just as difficult to achieve. Um, at a minimum, I think it will entail permanent effort. However you define it, success for this process will require both Iran and Israel to actively participate. That's, that's the bottom line. Both must be seen to be participating in this process if it can hope to succeed. And the vital question there is whether it's possible for both Iranian and Israeli national security interests to be advanced and to be seen to be advanced by the negotiation and potential creation of such a zone in the Middle East. Second is that if Iran goes nuclear, uh, I believe that if we did a short time, you will see other countries in the Middle East going nuclear. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, and so on and so forth. We are all speaking about the world without nuclear weapon. The first thing to do is not let, let new countries join in this prestigious club before or simultaneously when you speak about uh, uh, eliminating weapon of mass destruction worldwide. At the end of the day, the only people who can change the policy of Iran is not the superpower, it's not any other outside power, but it's the young people of Iran. Iran has civil society which is more advanced than any other country in the Middle East, I would say. Look at the women organization.
organizations, look at students' organizations, book publication, newspapers being published in Iran as long as they are allowed to be published. I think that can expect only that with the civil society, with the Iranian young people, if one day they will wake up and go to, to the streets and do what they, 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 they want to do and, and shape the country in their own mode. At, at this stage, I would say, there are two trains that have left the terminal already in Tehran. One train is carrying the message of nuclear power, and the other train is carrying the message of political change in Iran. Unfortunately, from what I see, the nuclear train is driving much faster than the train with social change. Thank you. For, from our perspective as a Palestinian, we should ask what comes first. I think what comes first, peace or the free the Middle East? This competition between Iran and Israel is justified by the conflict. And the conflict in the Middle East is centered, is centered around the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And without, without creating peace, I think all what we are talking about it will become, sorry to say, but baseless. Because Israel said, justify that it, it exists in a hostile environment, they have to have a clear capability to protect itself from enemies. I think it's very easy as a Palestinian to present this topic. We are for this topic and we will support it. But I still, we still think that without solving the Palestinian <coughs> conflict, the region is going from bad to worse. I think it's quite clear from the discussion we heard uh, right now that the peoples of the Middle East, they are facing some very difficult choices. And they will continue to face these choices for quite some time to come. One way to get there, I think, is through science and technology and collaboration. And this is why I will propose only one point today. And that is the establishment of a regional group of verification and implementation experts. This group would meet regularly to discuss technical issues devoid of politics. The purpose of this group would be to demonstrate, hopefully, that a treaty is verifiable when agreed and show the way to do so. Because one thing is certain here, all parties in this region insist that the zone should be verifiable. And so far we have very few ideas on how to do this. Being realistic, but this may be this, this is not going to be an easy conference at all. I think the first objective should be that it becomes the start of an ongoing process. We're drawing together some conclusions and recommendations that have come out of these various discussions. It's clear that this Edinburgh conference supports those who want the Helsinki conference to lead towards establishing a zone and recognise that whether the conference is able to initiate or contribute to a process for negotiations is going to depend on direct practicalities such as the agenda, participation, conduct and the outcome of the 2012 conference. It was proposed to send a message that this UN Edinburgh conference supports the conference being held in, in 2012, that we expect and indeed call on all states from the region to participate in the Helsinki conference constructively and with appropriate levels of authority and expertise. I would say thank you to my friends on the UNA Edinburgh Committee and particularly to, of course, Alec Gaines who's done so much to support <laughs> Without Alec, nothing would be possible. <laughs> and don't argue. <laughs> Although we are civil society speaking, uh, in this instance, um, and we can speak for ourselves, we have also to speak to policymakers. And that's why I feel it's been very important that the Scottish Parliament has been the host for us today. I'm very grateful to MSPs uh, and to the Parliament itself for allowing us to be here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for participating. And keep going.